Hey, welcome to Calvary. Whether this is your first weekend or you've been here for years or it was years ago and you're back, wherever you are, whenever you are, however you found us, you are so welcome. And, and honestly, one of the reasons you are so welcome is because we here have experienced that same welcome from Jesus. So welcome. He's why we do what we do and seek to be who he is. There, there's no one like Jesus. He's the He's the center of our gravity, worthy of first place in our hearts and minds. And in fact, as we truly get to know him, everything else appears dull in comparison. So welcome. We're starting a new teaching series um, called Breathe Deeply. And, and I just want to ask you, would you do that with me for just a moment? Actually stop whatever you're doing and just take a, a deep breath and hold it in for a moment and let it out. And, and do that again. Deep breath. Hold it and let it out. Do you know that in the Bible, the Spirit of Christ is called the breath of God, the, the breath of life. So, so one more time, except this time, imagine Jesus breathing out the breath of life, his Spirit of God, as you breathe it in. And take a, take a deep breath. Spirit of God. Hold it for a moment and just let it out. You know, it's amazing how many metaphors and catchphrases deal with breath. Breathless, out of breath, don't waste your breath, tell my last breath, finding room to breathe again, catch your breath. And of course, in the last few years, I can't breathe. Someone once said we can go three weeks without food, three days without water, but only three minutes without breath. Biblically, breath is vital for spiritual life as well. God God breathed his life into us, the scriptures say. And the scriptures themselves are said to be God-breathed. That's what the word inspiration means. Everything that has breath, the psalmist says, is called to praise the Lord. And, and the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. So as we make our way into 2022, having just taken 50 days to dive into hope, we're, we're not going to ponder how to find life in an out-of-breath world by breathing deeply of the life of God. In this teaching, as we begin, we're looking at words written by the Apostle Paul. And you know, sometimes someone speaks words and they're just words, but sometimes words become incarnated truth. You know what I mean? Like the message has saturated somebody's soul. They're, they've lived this truth out. They're speaking from experience. And, and these words from Paul that we're going to look at in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 were not just words for him. They were incarnated truth, a life message for a while now. I've been stuck on a few dozen words about Paul that I think we need to consider if we really want to know the power and the incarnated truth of 2 Corinthians 4. They're words that God delivered to Paul through a man named Ananias before Paul was actually Paul, back when he was Saul. They're in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 16. And here's what it says. But the Lord said to him, Go, him as Ananias, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before kings, before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Chosen vessel, chosen by God. I mean, doesn't something just grab our hearts when we talk about being chosen? Garrison Keeler recalls the childhood pain of being chosen last for the baseball teams. The, the captains are down to their last grudging choices, a, a slow kid for catcher, someone to stick out in right field where nobody hits it. And, and so they choose the last ones two at a time, you and you, because it really makes no difference. I remember those days. And there's just something that connects at the deepest level of our hearts when we're chosen. It, it, it's a theme of every wedding I've ever done. Every wedding is a moment saying, I choose you, and in 38 years, I still haven't gotten over the fact that Lynn said yes to me. <laughs> of course, neither has she. But, but when she said yes, she said, I choose you. Many of you have extended that choosing to children or foster kids or sponsored kids, adopted kids. It's powerful to know I've been chosen. Maybe right now you can think of some personal chosen moments, chosen for a promotion or chosen as a friend chosen for a scholarship or, or by a team. What comes to your mind when you hear, hey, you've been chosen? And, and I know context matters. I'm, I'm talking about a choosing that says, I see you. I, I see something of value in you. You matter. I, I want you on my team. I want you close to me, that kind of choosing. You know, before he became a Jesus follower, Paul's name was Saul. And, 
And Saul was kind of an interesting guy. He was born to wealthy parents. He was educated in the the finest university in his country. At some point, he so passionately embraced his religious heritage that he he came to view Christians, Jesus' followers, as the enemy. And and he, he began to gain the support of religious and national leaders. And as a result of that, he began to terrorize those who did not believe like he believed. Christians were were thrown in jail and tortured and killed. He, he became this kind of living, breathing boogeyman. Like I just imagine Christian parents might say to their kids, if you're not good, Saul's going to get you. He, he was the guy who had Stephen, one of our first leaders, one of our great leaders, stoned to death. But, but then one day as he traveled to Damascus on his way to persecute more Christians, he had this intense encounter with Jesus, with the risen Christ, and Jesus literally knocked him off his donkey. <laughs> blinded his eyes and told him that his life was headed in the wrong direction. Go to Damascus and wait for my instructions, Jesus said to him. So his friends led him into town by the hand and he waited there blind for three days. And and during those days, it says in Acts 9, that God spoke to a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Thank God for Ananias because nobody else in the Christian community wanted to have anything to do with Saul. In fact, let's be honest, Ananias probably wasn't all that excited about it. God spoke to him in a vision and he said, Ananias, go to Straight Street to the house of Judas and ask for Saul of Tarsus. He's praying to me right now. At this moment, he's praying to me. (laughs) I don't know. But I think Ananias probably said something like, God, are you out of your ever-loving mind? I mean, I know you think he's changed, but what if it's just a trick? Listen, Ananias, I, I want you to go to Saul. I want you to tell Saul that he is a chosen vessel of mine. Wow. I mean, imagine hearing that. I I believe that those seven words combined with a kick-butt Jesus encounter changed Saul's life to be chosen by God when he was the enemy of God, to be loved when all he had given Jesus was hate. I mean, what if you truly believed that you were chosen by God? In the book, The Whisper Test, Mary Ann Bird writes, "I, I grew up knowing that I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palette. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear how I looked how there's this little girl with a misshapen lip and crooked nose, lopsided teeth and garbled speech. When my classmates asked, she said, what happened to your lip? I would tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. She said, I I was convinced that nobody outside my family could love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade, her second grade teacher. Everybody loved Mrs. Leonard. She was so filled with life every year. She said, we we had a hearing test. And and I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, Miss Leonard sitting at her desk would whisper something and and we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue or do you have new shoes? And I I waited for those words. Later, I realized they were God-given words to me. Seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. See, to be chosen by God is like God saying to To every person ever deformed by failure or the past, things done by or done against you, I wish you were my kid. I wish you were my child. I I choose you. I I choose you. And before I go any further, can I I just tell you, if, if you are a Christ follower, you are God's chosen vessel. God has chosen you and and he's shaping you. He adopted you into his family because he wanted to. He's created you for a purpose, not just Paul. Not not just Saul who would become Paul, you. The prophet Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. He said, and yet, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Like we're all on the potter's wheel, formed by the hand of God. Paul would later reflect on his life and his experience and he would write in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, one of my life verses, I love this verse, he says, for we are God's masterpiece, literally poema, literally it's you are what God does. He's created us anew, Paul said, in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he, God, planned for us long ago. But we can't stop there because Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4 carry weight, not 
not just because he was chosen by God. They, they are incarnated truth because of the life he lived for God, because of what he walked through with God. Back to Acts chapter 9, Ananias, God said, go to Saul. <laughs> oh my God, do you know all the bad stuff Saul has done? But the Lord said, go, for he's a, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I'll be honest. <laughs> if, if I'm Ananias in that moment, I'm thinking, wait a minute, he's going to suffer? <laughs> Well, why didn't you tell me that? That, that jerk Saul was going to suffer. I can, I can deliver that message. But, but just let that message soak into your own heart and mind, your soul, for just a moment. He, he's a chosen vessel, God said. Tell him he's a chosen vessel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And in other words, Saul, you're, you're my chosen vessel, but if you want to fill your jar with Jesus, man, it's going to hurt. If you want to become like Jesus... I'm telling you, you're going to suffer. And I, and I just, I can't get away from, the, from this moment. For years, I, I, I haven't, I, I've always wanted, I can't help but wonder if God meant it literally. Like, why not? As Saul sat there blind in Damascus, be, before Ananias came or after Ananias came, did God give Saul this vision of every moment of hardship and pain and difficulty and suffering that he would ever experience? And, and if you know Paul's story, you know there would be so many moments. In fact, sometimes he, he's annoying in how often he quotes his moments of pain and suffering for Christ. Like in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28, he said, I, I've been in jail so many times I can't count whippings without number facing death time and time again, three times beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I faced danger from flooded rivers and robbers, danger in the cities and, and deserts and stormy seas. I've lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. And, and what if in those days, those three days, God gave him a vision of every hard, painful, suffering, moment of suffering he'd, he'd experienced if he decided to go full out for Jesus? if he sought to fill the jar of his life to the brim with Christ. And then God said, okay, Saul, now you choose. Your choice, your jar filled with Jesus and your life filled with suffering or, or your jar filled with stuff and a lifetime of comfort. What would you choose? We know what Paul chose. Paul chose his jar filled with Jesus. Do you know, do you know what that means? It means that Paul had found that one brief encounter with the presence <coughs> of Jesus on the way to Damascus to be so awesomely amazing, so wonderfully sweet and powerfully compelling that it was worth any price. God, fill up my jar with Jesus. I mean, that's got to be, that moment has to be what Paul had in his heart when he wrote 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 is for those who are going through such tough times that it just seems like, I can't catch my breath. <laughs> I mean, we live in an out-of-breath world, don't we? I mean, there's so many moments where emotionally or spiritually or relationally or, or even physically, it just seems like I can't catch my breath. I, I can't catch my breath. I'm anxious all the time. I don't, I don't have any energy. It seems like, seems like it, it feels like I'm, I'm losing heart. And I love Paul's honesty in 2 Corinthians 4, his vulnerability. Listen to his words in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we have this purpose, this calling, we do not lose heart. Now, in an always connected Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram world, everyone is constantly putting the best moments of their story on display. But the reality is that sometimes life is hard and our stories get messy, right? I mean, let's be honest, life isn't always easy and sometimes hearts are at risk. You realize that when Paul wrote those words, because of God's mercy, we do not lose, lose heart. He, he wrote them because people were losing heart. And if there's anything that we know after the last 22 months and even the last few weeks, our, our neighborhoods, our families, our church, our world has more than a few people who are losing heart. I mean, pick an age group. From the youngest to the oldest, pick a vocation, any vocation, doesn't matter. Every race, single married divorce, with or without kids, doesn't change the reality all around us. People are losing heart. So take a deep breath and 
And just pause and hear Paul's challenge. Paul's saying, let's be honest about our story, but in the midst of the honesty, don't lose heart. Don't let your heart get hard. Don't stop taking the risk of love. Sometimes life is hard, but that doesn't mean it can't be good. And, and here's why I can say that. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. He says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay in order to show that, show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed even in our mortal body. See, Paul says, we have a treasure and we have a power from God that is at work in and around us. But then he strings together some pretty fun words, right? Hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. In fact, in the Greek language, those are all battle terms. Paul's saying sometimes it's like we're fighting for every breath we take. Fighting for every breath we take. Hard-pressed was a metaphor for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Paul's giving people this picture like you've been pushed into a corner. The enemy, the mess is, is pressing up against you. It's close, maybe even inside of you, and, and you're out of wiggle room. There's no more options. You can't change your story, but Paul says that when God's power is at work in and through us, we are cornered, but we're not crushed. Now, that Greek word for perplexed, it, it means that we're, we're completely out of resources. We have absolutely no idea what to do next with nothing left to give you've tried everything you could get your hands on but now you feel like your your hands are tied your heart is drained help is gone and defeats the only option just give in to the mess give in to the lies give in to the sin give in to the battle but paul says that when god's power is at work in and through us even in our perplexity we're helpless but we're not hopeless you know what persecuted means. People are against you, actively working to harm you. They don't like you. Not only have you been persecuted, but your enemy has caught you, caught you, and struck you down. Your, your feet have been taken out from under you. How could it look any worse? You're, you're on your butt, backed up in a corner with no help. But, but Paul says that if God's power is at work in us, we may be abused, but we're not alone. We're not abandoned. And ultimately, in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the difficult chapters of life, he says, we are down, but we are not out. And, and I know, when it feels like we're fighting for every breath, looking at the darkness all around us, maybe even inside of us, we might wonder, is there any good news? And Paul says, yes. Don't lose heart. Breathe deeply. Because listen, something deeper than you can imagine is going on inside of you. God is at work shaping a glory in you that, that one day will cause all of creation to stand and cheer. He's actually drawing closer to you right now than you can even begin to imagine. In the battle, in the battle, you start to see his fingerprints all over your life. Can I give you a name for where we find ourselves in those down but not out days? It's called a crucible. We're in the crucibles of life. John Orberg once said, I read this on Terry Walling's Facebook page, he said, if you ask people who don't believe in God why they don't believe in God, the number one reason will be the suffering of mankind. But if you ask people who believe in God, when they grew the most spiritually, the number one answer will be in those moments that they experienced suffering. <laughs> That's a crucible. It's a season when, when our hearts are transformed and and we're shaped for glory. The, the very story of our lives at times is, is rewritten in the crucibles of hard times, the heat of pain and, and difficulty. That word crucible comes from the ancient Latin word crucibulum, which was simply a, a hardened pot, earthen pot used to melt metal. It was a jar used to bring intense heat to something that needed radical transformation. And this idea of a crucible, it's, it's woven throughout Scripture. In Proverbs 17, 3, it says, The crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests, he refines the heart. In Isaiah 48, 10, God is talking to his people. He says, See, I've refined you, though not as silver. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction, in the heat of pain. 
And it's not just Old Testament stuff. In Acts 14, 22, we are encouraged to endure with these words. It says, we must go through many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. All through scripture, we find the necessity of the crucible over and over again. In fact, Paul's words that we just read in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 11 are describing the crucible experience. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So, This is the crucible, it's the heat of pain and difficulty, the death that brings about the life. So how do we get through the crucibles of life? Breathe deep. (laughs) Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Here's what he says. He says, It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us from Jesus. Here's what I want to say. Breathe deeply of resurrection faith. Just breathe it and say it. It matters to say it. Paul says we believe it, so we speak it. Breathe in the resurrection and speak it out in faith. Say it over and over again. Make it what what I call others call a breath prayer. As you breathe in, pray, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you breathe out, for my resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, for my resurrection. Because it's not just the resurrection of Christ. That's where it has to begin, but it's our resurrection also. We know, Paul says, that the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us. Never stop believing that the best is yet to come. Breathe it in. Your crucible is never the end of your story. Let your first waking breath every day bring a reminder of the empty tomb. And then look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 17. Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We breathe in the resurrection of faith. We we breathe deeply of future glory. Paul's not saying, just suck it up. What you're going through is nothing. He's saying in comparison to what's being achieved in you, the glory to come is far greater than any troubles now here. Breathe deep. I love how Paul talks about it in Romans 8. He says that all of creation, all of creation is groaning in anticipation like a woman in childbirth groaning to give birth to a new thing. Read Romans 8. Breathing deeply of future glory probably involves some groaning. We, we breathe in so that we can groan for glory. We groan in anticipation of what is to come. I love the story that Robert Smith shares. He was an African-American preacher and he once shared about his mother's groaning. He said, I, I used to watch my mother and I, I just I didn't understand. When we had physical needs, some lack no food. She'd, she'd walk around the house and, and, and start moaning, groaning. She used to say, when you moan, the devil doesn't know what you're talking about. And she'd walk around, mm, 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 and tears would be rolling down her eyes. He said, no food. <laughs> and then in the midst of her groaning, somebody's knocking on the door, and here comes some turnip greens and cornbread. He said, all she did was moan, and I didn't understand that, but I didn't dare ask her because she wasn't moaning to me. <laughs> her, her groaning was going to God. Her, her, her groaning was conceived in suffering, but it was meant to give birth to glory. And sometimes all we can do is groan. But we groan in hope, right? I mean, we see sexual choices destroying hearts, and we groan. We become part of a a relational rift, a divided church, and we we groan. We see families breaking, and we groan. We wonder if this or or that part of my heart or my life will ever change, and and we groan, but we groan in hope. And, And when hope and groaning collide, it becomes a prayer, a wordless prayer. We call it travailing prayer. It's prayer that begins with a burden but takes flight with hope. It's a, it's a prayer for new chapters of our life, of our, of our community, of our neighborhoods to be birthed. And, and, and if we can't groan in hope, we need to take a deep breath of God's story. That's the third place where we breathe deeply. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, it, it says this, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. 
So what, what Paul's saying here, I think, is that we need to breathe deeply of God's story. We need to fix our gaze on the unseen, eternal realities rather than letting our story, our narrative, be shaped by what we see or even what others tell us to see. (laughs) And I, I don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not talking about imagining some alternate reality where everything is good and life is comfortable and we have everything that we want whenever we want it. We need to stop pretending that the goal of this life is comfort and that faith just makes it easier to be comfortable. I'm telling you, God is not dreaming about giving us a way out. God dreams about giving us the strength to go through our pain, to go through the heat, to become living displays of glory. Isn't that his story? So when Paul calls us to fix our eyes on the unseen eternal realities, he's simply asking us to believe that what God says about reality is true. It's more true than anything you see on social media or CNN or Fox. Even when we don't see it, what God says is true is true to believe that the harvest is plentiful when we look out at our neighborhood. To believe that our battle is not against flesh and blood even when others attack us. To believe that Christ's glory is enough for our unity, even in the midst of division. To believe that you are his kid covered in his love, even when you feel unseen. To believe that the darkness will not prevail, even when hope seems unreasonable. That all of creation is waiting for the revealed party of your glory when you feel like you are covered in shame. To believe that you are, in fact, say this to yourself. I am God's jar. You are his chosen vessel. And my life is the container of a great treasure and an unimaginably great power. Isn't that what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 4, 7? But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He's calling us jars. <laughs> and, and what is a jar? It's a container, right? I mean, Most jars, most containers are defined by what they contain, a coffee cup, a water bottle, a a flower vase, a cookie jar, a fine bottle of wine. So when it comes to you, the jar of clay, which is your life, what is the treasure? What are you filled up with? Well, Paul says it it can be glory. I mean, read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4 or later, the, the treasure that God offers us inside is is the glory of God coming alive in your life. It's the Spirit making you more like Jesus. It's the transformation of your heart. Ultimately, it's the life of Jesus in you. When it comes to your life, God is passionately obsessed with one thing. He's shaping your jar for Jesus. He, He wants you to become so full of Jesus. And when people look at the container of your life, all they can see is his heart. He he wants to fill you so full of Jesus that the inside begins to shape the outside so that as you live and love like Jesus, his glory spills out of your jar into the jars of the lives of people all around you. But take a deep breath and hear me again. Your life full of Jesus doesn't happen without the crucible. It just doesn't happen without getting shaped on the potter's wheel. (laughs) See, we we want to change without the crucible. We want glory without the pain. We, We want resurrection without death. But in reality, that's the order. The crucible leads to change. Pain leads to glory. Death leads to life. And not a single hard time is wasted. But listen to Paul again in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He says, for a light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I want to tell you today, as we come to communion, nowhere is that more clear than when we remember the cross of Christ. Pain led to glory. Death led to life. His pain led to our glory. His death led to our life. He was broken so that his glory would spill out into our lives. That's what we're called to remember as we come to communion. So as we take communion in these next few moments, would you do this? Would you think of the hardest thing that you're going through now or, or, or believe might be ahead of you in the days to come? And as you listen to the music, wherever you are, just imagine holding that crucible, that, that event, that hard time in your hands and an offering to Jesus and breathe in resurrection life 
Breathe in future glory. Breathe in his story and just say to Jesus, I, I give this to you, Jesus. Do everything in me that you need to do so that you can do everything through me that you want to do. And as we remember the cross, wherever you are, all over our Calvary movement, wherever you're listening, as we remember the cross where his glory was poured out for our good, his suffering was not wasted, and neither will yours be as long as we surrender to Jesus, as long as we let our lives be the clay transformed by the potter to be filled up with the life and the death and the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. So let me pray for you. Father, I I pray, especially right now, for anybody listening, anybody going through one of those crucible moments, a moment that seems like it's stretched out into eternity, a moment that, that feels like it will never end. God, I pray that you would pour hope into their hearts. I pray that you would give them the the faith of resurrection to come. I pray that you would open their eyes to future glory like Paul saw saw in Romans 8. I I pray that, God, that, that you would remind them of your story, that you would give them the ability to remember and believe your story, to put their eyes on things that they don't see simply because you have said it's true. And as we celebrate Jesus, your life and your death, as we celebrate that moment where in the most amazing way you you poured out for us, you poured out your glory for us, you, you experienced pain and suffering for us, your death led to our life. As we remember that, as we offer to you the crucible moments, we simply say, Jesus, would you do everything in us that you need to do? so that you can do everything through us that you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.